Verse 11. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and he put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Okay, and that's the word Bethel. It means the house of God. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put in his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had previously been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I surely, I will surely give you, give a tenth to you. If you have an older translation, it will say a tithe to you. This passage is very instructive. Like his father, he determined that his giving unto God would be 10%. Once again, historical example presupposes a prior divine revelation. Now, either God revealed this to Jacob or he learned it from his father Abraham, but it, it, it's not arbitrary. It, it, number 10 keeps coming up. Note once again that, it, that the tithe is in response to God's blessing. 10% is what God expects. This is not the law of Moses. There's nothing ceremonial about this. 10% is what God expects. It is a recognition that God is our provider and our sustainer. It is an act of homage unto God. By tithing, we are expressing our belief that Jehovah has created and owns all things and controls all things. We are giving 10% of what he already owns back to his work. That's the principle here, if you study the passage carefully. Victor Hamilton writes this, quote, Thus far in, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the vow, Jacob has spoken about God as he. Here he addresses God directly. Of everything you give to me, a tenth I will tithe to you. As with Abraham and Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 20, a tenth is a token of Jacob's relationship with God. Here is evidence that Jacob is serious about his relationship to God. He commits himself to tithing. He also expresses awareness of the source of his provisions. Of everything you give to me. Now note, the examples of tithing of both Abraham and Jacob are A, connected to the southern Jerusalem and the northern places of worship, Bethel, the house of God. <clears throat> B, they are both 10%. As is taught later in the law, indicating not an arbitrary, that is something made up by man, not a purely arbitrary voluntary number, not a voluntary tithe, but rather a tithe based on prior revelation. The prior revelation of God. Unless you want to say that they just made it up, they thought it was a good idea, and uh, you can do something made up and God respects that, which is a rejection of the regular principle. 
in Sola Scriptura. C. The basis of the tithe is God's creation and ownership of all things, his sovereign control of all our blessings, and his deliverance or salvation of his people. Now, this is the central point here. There is absolutely nothing ceremonial about these pre Mosaic tithes. The historical examples of 10% tithe unto God prior to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai are clearly non ceremonial. The reasons that were given are just as theologically relevant today as they were then. The reasons are not based on ceremonial law. The reasons are based on God's nature and character and his salvation, his ownership of all things, his, the fact that we acknowledge that everything we have comes from his hand, and he blesses us. It's not based on the ceremonial law whatsoever. <clears throat> well, let's look at tithing in the law of Moses. So it's important that you acknowledge Abraham and Jacob. <clears throat> we find a number of passages regu uh, regulating tithing in the law of Moses. We don't have time to look at all of them. There were different tithes, some of which were bound up with Israel as a theocracy. We'll look at a few of them and make, make a few comments. Leviticus 27, 30 to 34, we read this. <clears throat> And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants it all to redeem one of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. Okay, the point, the point there is, is you have, let's say you have a, a, a bull or a, a goat, and it's extremely precious to you for breeding or something. And you just have to hang on to that bull or goat or, or, or sheep. Because it's, it's, it's one, your special breeding goat. You can substitute another goat for it, but you have to add 20% to it. And the reason was, is you would take your herd, and there would be a pen with a, a long thing like they use today for vaccinated cows and sheep. And they go through it, and at every tenth animal, the, the, the Levite would just hit it with a pole and mark it, according to Edersheim. You'd have to have a, a pole with something on it with some coloring, and he would just mark every tenth one, and that would be that would belong to the, the that would be given as a tithe. Verse thirty-two. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock and whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. <clears throat> In other words, whatever passes under the pole, you got to give. And if you complain about it, apparently you got to give that and another one too. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Now here's what the great uh, Scottish Presbyterian scholar Andrew Benar says of, of this section of Scripture. This is 1846. Free church fellow, I believe. <clears throat> Ten like seven is a complete number. The former means riches, or, I, or you could say uh, perfection, the latter fullness. Hence the tithe of ten, or tenth is properly what is taken out of man's plenty. <clears throat> when Abraham gave to Melchizedek and Jacob vowed at Bethel, has ever appeared to the godly the most natural portion for men to set aside for the Lord regularly the tenth of all. Among the Israelites, there were several kind of tithes, and yet all were cheerfully paid. The tenth for the Lord paid to the Levites. <clears throat> Numbers 18.21. And the next tenth, consequently, uh, consecrated and uh, feasted on at Jerusalem were given away to the poor. Deuteronomy 7.6 and 23.29. Cedar fruit might be redeemed... Okay, I was wrong about the animals. It's a cedar fruit. It might be redeemed. And there might be good reasons for a man wishing to redeem his, this part of the tithe. He might require corn to sow his field or be in need, uh, need of the seed of dates or pomegranates to replenish his orchard. Therefore, permission is given to redeem these, even still with the addition of a fifth, in order to show that the Lord is jealous and marks anything that might be a retraction on the man's part of what was due to the Lord. <clears throat> he may redeem his tithe, 
but it is done, done come nota. As to the Tyvel herd in the flock, this is not allowed. Okay, I was, uh, it was the, the, the redeeming was referring to seed. The owner of the Levite, whose office it was to tithe, held a rod in his hand and touched every tenth animal as it happened to come forward. Jeremiah 33, 13. Whatever passed under the rod, good or bad, was tithed and taken inalienably. The Lord does not seek a good animal, where the rod numbering lighted on a bad is a tenth passed by. Neither does he admit of the substitution of an inferior animal if the rod is lighted on the best in the whole flock. He seeks just what is his due, teaching a strict and holy disregard of by-ends and selfish interests. And thus this book, this pictorial gospel of the Old Testament, ends, by the way, this is the end of Leviticus, the section we read, ends with stating God's claims on us and his expectation of our service and willing devotedness. As the first believers of Pentecost, rejoicing in pardon and the love of God, counted nothing dear to them, nor said what ought they, possessed was their own, so ought we to live. We must sit loose from earth, and true love to our Redeemer will set us loose. This giving up of our possessions at God's call teaches us to live a pilgrim life. And that is an Abrahamic life. Nay, it is a life of faith and opposition to sight. The whole of this concluding chapter has been leading us to the idea of giving to the Lord all we have. It has, made, it has been making us familiar with the idea and by example inculcating the practice of an unreserved devotedness. God should be all in all to us. He is God all sufficient. That's his commentary on Leviticus 507 to 508. Now it was generally understood according to the commentators, that tithes on crops and domesticated animals was, was on the increase from year to year. If you had 10 new sheep born in that year, one of them went to the Lord. Whatever, it was the increase. If you had a good crop, 10%. Deuteronomy, uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to shall surely tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thine oil, of the firstlings of the herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry on, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shall go into the place, go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lustest after, for oxen and for sheep, for wine, for strong drink, for whatsoever thy soul desire. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates. Thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath... Uh, no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithes of thine increase the same year, and thou shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Now this section seems a little more complicated, and there are different views regarding it. The annual tithe is restated in verse 22, and the Hebrew construction is emphatic. Giving unto the Lord is a divine imperative. It's emphatic in the Hebrew. In Leviticus 27, 30 to 33, in Numbers 18, 21 and following, we learn the tithe is for the Levites. The priests officiated the tabernacle and temple, and the Levites had various duties. Aside from, uh, from the ceremonial aspects, they were the religious teachers of Israel. In 